So I would like to call up to the uh, podium, uh, call back uh, Johnny Hansen uh, to, to join us, and we'll be inviting David Moore, as well as uh, Janina Slosky, uh, who are from our Alexander Forbes investments team. I'd like to kick off the panel with a framing statement, so excuse me for digging in the notes, because it's quite a lengthy read, um, but here we go. So. In the African context, sustainable investment refers to the integration of priorities other than commercial returns, such as governance, climate change, human rights, job creation, and education, amongst others, into the investment process of practitioners. According to AVCA, the African Venture Capital Association, local and international DFIs, or development finance institutions, have led the charge in this regard, having, de having deployed the majority of the 25 billion US dollars of sustainable investment over the five years running to 2017, specifically in private markets. Is sustainable investment the true solution for Africa and SA's problems? And if so, how do we really mobilize local and institutional capital to adopt a truly sustainable investment lens when deploying capital to address these problems? So to kick off, Johnny, I'm going to start with you. First up, so you're a, you're a snappy dressing Danish gentleman, as we can see, who, uh, who's been doing plenty of sustainably orientated investment across Africa for the past decade or two. What lessons can you share with us from specifically up north, uh, north, north of our borders in the Nordic regions as to what sustainable investment truly means? Does it have legs? And is it really something that is going to address the structural challenges that we find permeating our current economy? Sure, thank you. In, in my presentation, I also uh, alerted to the fact that you actually need to go with the trend. And I even think in, in the Nordic, it was also the market, and even the politicians that was, that was driving it initially. Um, I actually want to give a specific example, but maybe more macro example. So I also mentioned that Denmark could use all these amazing wind turbines. But how did that come about? Because that was actually not the industry driving it. It was driven by, by politicians who, who were coming up with regulations and starting to put taxes on pollution, clean water, and, and companies saw um, a business opportunity in investing in, in these opportunities, in, in technologies, developing technologies that could lower um, the use of water, clean the water that was let out, uh, make cheaper electricity, etc. And that's very much what, what's on the agenda uh, on, the, on the sustainable development goals, how you can drive an impact using those technologies. It was very much driven by politicians with foresight and, and, and the consumers who, who were demanding this. And, and maybe just another example, go, go across the, the sea to my Swedish brothers and sisters. Um, you look at the pension funds there, it, it's also very much the customers who have been driving that they are so impact focused as they are, and, and actually probably spearheading the Nordic countries uh, when it comes to, to looking at impact investment from, from pension funds. Great, Thank, thanks Johnny. Um, Elias, bringing it closer to home and thinking around or, or hearing what Johnny said around more pro progressive pension fund policies and, and trustees and corporates and politicians alike, what do you think we're doing wrong in the, well firstly, how much real impact investing is actually materialized in terms of invested capital, you know, in terms of on a relative basis to developed markets per se or African uh, colleagues or, or neighbors and, and to the extent that it's well below expectations, which I think you've already touched on, um, what are we getting wrong? Like, how do we better implement it at an institutional investor level to mobilize that capital? Let me start off with the numbers, which are very difficult, but uh, I'll give an estimate. When the 5% was arrived at, at NEDLEC, it was premised on what government, sorry, private sector had committed to government to put towards developmental investing. But if you look at all the surveys that have been done, including amongst pension funds, very few have allocated more than 10% of their assets under management towards this kind of investing. There are various reasons for this. 
part of the reason uh, frame is that many of the pension funds are unable to bring on board the right skilled trustees to be able to manage the risk associated with this. It's only the middle-sized to large pension funds that are able to invest in that kind of intellectual capital. Furthermore, there's research that needs to go into that. And that research doesn't come free. It comes at a cost. So the smaller pension funds are unable to do that. So scale is important. And this is why the influence from the FSCA, previously FSB, was to try and see consolidation in the sector going forward. And part of this consolidation is about increasing the efficiencies of pension funds so they can be able to do the right things going forward. At the, at the macro level, I think the reason we're not doing, we're not doing it properly, I think it's because we're short-termist short in our thinking. We are chasing maximum returns at the shortest possible time at the highest possible cost. And we should remind ourselves that the financial sector crisis that we're trying to get out of today was because of greed and short-termism. And if we continue, another crisis is waiting for us around the corner. And that corner is not far from today. Thanks, Elias. Um, Yanina, picking up on what Elias said around the fact that there's potentially you know, not sufficient skill at trustee level to assess these opportunities. What are you seeing um, in terms of practical steps that can be taken from a consultant perspective in terms of, you know, being the gatekeepers to a lot of institutional money? How can we better mobilize that through engaging boards of trustees in your capacity and, and your peers in the industry to actually get that to move? Well, I certainly agree with Elias that it is a challenge in terms of governance budgets, of trustees, um, the cost of actually doing the research and so on. And I think there is a skill set that you need in the consultant to be able to do the consulting. Um, obviously, unlisted investments are a lot more challenging to include in the suite of investments um, for uh, retirement funds. And I, I do have to make a comment first about just the structural issue of the South African retirement fund industry, which I think people fundamentally have to understand. I always talk about uh, your typical overseas pension fund, especially, let's say, in the Nordics, are typically defined benefit funds, very long dated and often underfunded. So they sort of have LDI strategies to protect uh, the assets that they have, and then they do look for um, higher risk, higher opportunity assets. So they are more naturally going to look for unlisted with higher returns. Whereas traditionally in South Africa, your funds are defined contribution. There's a lot of focus on daily unit pricing, ability for members to switch, and always concerns about liquidity and so on. So I think it's fairly easy in that space to say, gee, we don't have the governance budgets. We can't pay a consultant all that we would need to do the research, and let's face it, it's difficult. But that is quite facile. I mean, there are ways to look at it. Uh, Elias also referred to liquid real assets. There are opportunities to actually to get better returns that are fairly liquid and do fit well, well within a defined contribution environment. And I think what's uh, one of the main barriers is just the consultant's skill to actually look for different alternatives, not necessarily costly research, but actually looking for viable alternatives that they can bring to trustees. Not necessarily re requiring strong uh, governance budgets, but very feasible to start introducing assets like that, which would end up having development impact while still working very well within the context of our retirement industry. May, may I just comment on, on consultants? It's, it's one point that I thought I should have mentioned. Part of the weakness of our boards of trustees is the bad advice that they get for consultants. <laughs> so, are the consultants me, in the obviously. room? <laughs> <laughs> the many of them are very risk averse and border on being lazy because it's much more difficult to make money in the area uh, we're talking about as opposed to the listed space. If you can make the same return by less effort, then the likelihood is they'll follow that route. And I think as boards of trustees become more skilled, more educated, and more capable of making independent decisions, there may be a huge risk of these consultants being disintermediated going forward. 
the choice is really in their hands, whether they want to play the game or they don't. Johnny, do you want to add something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just want to add on the, because um, I've, I've been sitting, doing the due diligence uh, on direct investments, and, and it is really time consuming. You do require the skills. Um, I've been also investing in the funds where we do assess the skill set of the funds. So, so it, it is a capacity that needs to build, be built up um, among the trustees. I'm going to keep a stay with you, Johnny, and, and give you another question here. And it, it does relate specifically to, you know, you've got a multitude experience of, of investing in ESG-orientated assets and or funds through, through in the African context. Um, can you paint us a, a bit of a picture as to what a truly sustainable investment looks like? I know you've given us a couple of case studies, but um, in terms of structure, return, sustainable impact, how you measure, and... Uh, and more importantly, give us, give us kind of the route to market that you think is most appropriate for an institutional investor in South Africa to access that opportunity set. Yeah, but the example I gave on, on the fish feed factory in, in Zambia was pretty much exactly that. Going through the whole due diligence, actually taking into consideration the different aspects and really thinking the full circle, the full all the stakeholders into to, to the picture from the very beginning, including community, staff, suppliers, off-takers, etc. cetera. Um, and, and, and that's really the, the whole full circle you need to go through from, from the very beginning till the very end. And also in the, in the project monitoring of, of the projects. Um, it doesn't just stop once you make your investment decision. You need to constantly monitor. There needs to be reporting on ESG issues, uh, quite significant reporting, uh, I may add. And, and again here, the companies you invest in or the funds you invest in does require to have a certain level of skill set in order to be able to, to do such things. Great, thanks. And, and another open question to any of the panelists, and feel free to answer, is uh, you've all had experience in sustainability or impact investing in various guises, but how can it go wrong? And and I think at the end of the day, that's going to be front and center for the Board of Trustees and, and those that are going to preside over decisions to funds and or underlying investee companies. Do you have an example or an instance where you could share that it didn't work out so well and impact wasn't created and, f and for what reason? Well, maybe uh, I can <laughs> give some examples. Um, I think one of your real challenges, particularly when you're looking at ma massive infrastructure, so say building wind farms, etc. I mean, there you're obviously dealing with a lot of different stakeholders. Your government, um, the lands that you're going to be using, who you're going to be interacting with, who you're going to get your approvals for, and so on. So there certainly was a, a case, I won't be too specific, but um, a fund that was investing into a Kenyan wind farm, where they'd done everything right. It was um, going to be off-take from the government, so they had all the government approvals. There were communities that were going to be impacted, by the actual land that was going to be used. There was compensation from them, they were moved. You know, the infrastructure that was built around the wind farm was to their benefits. And they got the usual benefits in terms of the health clinics and the adult education, uh, schooling for the children, etc. So generally, so far, so good, a good uh, story. And unfortunately, things went horribly wrong. The community on the next lot of farms decided gee, we've missed out here. <laughs> we also want some of this good stuff, this good impact that we're starting to see. And they actually invaded the land. And it turned very nasty. Eventually the police got involved, someone got shot. Eventually the whole thing had to collapse. And um, the funders pulled out. It's not really what you want as an international investor to have your reputation associated with something like this. And obviously now you're in the, the space of saying, now we have to try and get compensation back from government money was spent, it needs to be compensated for and so on. So it's quite an extreme example, but it does say that no matter how much you plan and try to get everything right within the, the factors that are within your control, sometimes things can go wrong and fairly dramatically. And that's what you, as an investor going into these investments, you have to expect that these things are going to happen. You manage it so that it's one in uh, several uh, success stories. Um, but on that basis, you, you do have to understand that it can happen. 
if I may add to that one, and I don't know if it's the same wind farm, <laughs> but it is a big wind farm <laughs> in Kenya. And, and uh, I totally agree, there was a lot of things that was done wrong, and uh, the, the local community and the invading community. Uh, however, they are producing power now, um, and they're actually getting it to the consumers, because they started producing without having the transmission net. Again, that was also something that went wrong in the project, that it wasn't combined. Uh, mainly due to, to the Kenyan government. Um, hence, there were some funders who pulled out of it because they, they could see that coming. Um, but luckily now it is actually producing cheap energy to the Kenyan population, providing 400 megawatts. Um, but yeah, a lot of things did go wrong and, and it's very, very difficult to, to plan this, and especially with larger infrastructure projects. Sure. Elias? Yeah. Um, the simple answer is things will go wrong if you are in investing. The question is, why do they go wrong? And in most cases, they will not go wrong because you are involved in developmental investing or impact investing. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you three regional examples of where the principle was applied. Even if things had gone wrong, people would not regret. I'll start with South Africa. Most recent example is Edcon. If you can just close your eyes and imagine the ripple effect Edcon would have had in the economy had it shut down, you can understand the necessity to throwing money at Edcon. Private sector was drawn in to put money into Edcon. That was a very typical impact investment. And I don't think there'll be a better impact investment in South Africa for many, many mon mon months to come. The second one, still within South Africa, is about rural, rural malls. When the GPF started to invest in rural malls, people were thinking they are crazy. The experience was a very, very positive one. They would come in where there was absolutely nothing but mud huts, throw in the blob of concrete, and all of a sudden, multiple industries would emerge around that mall. There's no better impact you can have in the rural community than bringing all the services that they want closer to them. The second region is the United Arab Emirates. When Mubadala was set up, it was set up with one objective. It was not a commercial objective. It was to dis diversify the United Arab Emirates economy. Look at where they are today. Had they not done it, there would still be an oil economy. And the last one that I would like to share is the example of India and Tata. Today, when the board of Tata walks into the boardroom, the first question they ask is, what is the impact we want to have amongst Indians? Once they've identified the, that impact, only then do they ask the question, how do you make money out of it? Very different psyche to what we have back home. Thank you. Sure. Johnny, you wanted to add to that? Um, yeah, I actually wanted to answer your question specifically. I have way too many examples of <laughs> things that go wrong. And I would say it, it's actually not the impact side of it that goes wrong. It's the, it's the fundamentals of the project which are not right. Um, and not the impact side of it. Sometimes you can get misled by a very nice project. Looks good, creates amazing impact and you do the project even though you're doubting the fundamentals. But it's always the fundamentals that go wrong. Sure, thanks. And then tagged onto a previous question that I asked, what's the best way, because ultimately we have boards of trustees and or multiple stakeholders that are, are managing pension fund money here. That if they want to get access to truly sustainable investing platforms and or products, how do they, what's the best means of investing and, and how do they get access to it? You know, what's the technology? Can they buy it on a listed exchange, or what do they need to do? Well, I believe you, if you really want to create significant impact, and, and you don't necessarily have the resources to build up a, a great team to do it, you, you would invest through fund of funds. That question wasn't planted. <laughs> it actually wasn't. <laughs> I do believe it. <laughs> but I think you do, I mean, some of the examples, obviously I gave the extreme ones, so no one else was uh, willing to meet me on the smaller <laughs> examples that they had. Um, 
but it does illustrate the challenge. Um, and we haven't spoken a lot about the fact that normally if you're going into unlisted, you're going into a vehicle, a fund. It's got a commitment period, it starts to deploy, it keeps the assets for up to 10 years, and then it starts selling down. So you've got to be patient investor. It is a liquid, secondary markets are not attractive, etc. So I mean, those are all the challenges that the trustees have to get their minds around if they're going to allocate a governance budget to go into unlisted, and where the consultant's going to have to invest and make sure they're not going to lock their um, clients into an unexpectedly long-dated investment um, that isn't liquid. So that is where you start coming to a fund of fund concept that says a single investor. I mean, Elias referred earlier to the fact that the largest investors in South Africa have gone into impact, impact investment successfully because they can set up sufficient funds to get all of the um, different exposures across underlying assets, vintage years, etc. But if you're starting to come down the line to the smaller investor, fund of funds where it's, it, it starts to become feasible because they're the vintage exposures and the different underlying obligated for you and included it at a cost obviously is the expertise to select those funds to manage those funds to make sure that the managers of those funds are still in place still locked in still paying attention and so on so it starts to become a lot feasible when you're talking about let's go into a fund of fund if we are a medium-sized investor and then, as I said earlier, that we would do want to see more liquid asset opportunities that come on. We've got green bonds. We've got listed infrastructure bonds. Um, we have had funds that are fairly um, liquid um, that have been set up that are very large in the um, institutional space where they already have huge impact investments included. So, they, so there are lots of entry points, even if you're not the largest investor and not able to go into several funds with long dates and um, all of the liquidity, no secondary market issues. I would like to be radical. <laughs> no. I, think, I think you need to create your own platforms. If you're playing this space, you need to be bold, you need to take leadership, you need to be able to understand the risk in which you're going into and manage it yourself. That's the best way to play the game. There is nothing as frustrating as putting capital in a fund and they sit on that money for two years without deploying it and they turn around and say, there is no pipeline. Rather create your own pipeline. Be very creative. Engage with the entrepreneurs because the entrepreneurs know what is emerging in the market and fund those entrepreneurs that are going to give you what you want. That's the only way to do it successfully. If you're going to wait for funder funds to have impact, you'll wait for a very long time. Thanks, and I think um, we're, we're heading tight on time, but uh, I think we're going to defer to some questions from the audience that I'm seeing pop up in front of me. So I'll open these up to the panel. Whoever wants to, to jump in, jump in. The first one is, um, is pension fund board of trustees specific. And the question goes, how can we better persuade people on boards as in the trustees, to implement sustainable investing into their actual portfolios. So probably speaking to incentive structure, but I'll leave it to the panelists to, to address that. I think it's a, a role that a lot of us can play, and it's the sort of conversation we're having today is igniting the interest. Um, I find that a lot of times your trustee boards are very busy, they've got their other jobs, they come once a quarter. If they can just get through all of the other stuff they've got to do as well as investments, you know, then phew, what a relief. So in that sort of environment, uh, LS referred to some laziness amongst some consultants, it's easy not to ignite interest, to not put it on the table, and then no way trustees ever going to, unless they're personally passionate. So it is a large responsibility of the gatekeepers, that if you take impact investing into an environment like that, you will ignite interest, people will make the time for it, and obviously you've got to be skilled as a consultant to walk the path with them. So I think it's very feasible to do it, but you've got to find the way to open that door, and I think it's a responsibility we take away from a day like this to actually say, we want to make a difference to our country, we want to avoid prescription, let's go ignite interest and in impact investing and the assets will flow. Sure. Any other takers? Yeah, and I would like to go back to fundamentals. It's how, how you persuade them is, is basically a risk versus return consideration. And uh, if you do take ESG and impact into your 
to your risk consideration, you're actually lowering your risk. So again, may, may need a little bit of, of education, a little bit of research here. Um, but, it, but it's that fundamental, risk versus return, that also makes me disagree with you. Again, I would love if, if people would, would build up the team to do this, but it does come with a high risk. And as long as that can be managed, cool, do it. But, um, and of course you must expect your fund of funds to, to perform and not just sit on, on the fund. Mm -hmm. And a somewhat contentious question, but linked to Elias's point around asset consultants. How do we, do we need a new breed of asset consultants in the industry or do we need to tweak how they behave and operate to make this work? Maybe I'll let Elias start <laughs> on that one. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, the retirement fund industry in South Africa is challenging. <laughs> I mean, we'll talk more about it in uh, the, the session that we have after lunch when we continue look, to look at prescribed assets. But yes, to some extent, I think you do need a new breed of asset consultant because this is challenging. It's not your easy, I just go every day and put my usual agenda pack together and I do my reporting and I didn't ask any, uh, get, ask any difficult questions, so phew, what a relief, off I go again. But that's no way you can differentiate yourself as an asset consultant. You want to differentiate yourself, you've got to come with something different. And let's hope it becomes mainstream in the future. And, and, and obviously, there's a lot of very good consultants out there who are igniting interest, where their clients have got huge investments in, into impact investments, and they really get it. So I think to differentiate yourself right now, you probably as an asset consultant want to be looking at things like that and saying, I'm going to create passion here, I'm going to go out and do something different. And as I said, um, the fact that we've got prescription hanging over us to some extent says we haven't done enough. This is the opportunity to say, if I still want a job as an asset consultant, I still need retirement funds. Uh, this is one way that I can make the difference and actually make sure that my retirement funds still exist for me to consult to because they are investing in South Africa in development assets. I, I, I think you need asset consultants that are broad-minded, that don't only think commercial return. We can see the social strife in South Africa today, we can see the tension, but we still have consultants who don't believe that we need to invest in Soweto, who don't believe in BEE, who still don't believe that there is value in investing in the rural parts of South Africa. They exist today as we speak. Now, if you have a board of trustees that cannot see the narrowness of that thinking, they will continue allocating capital according to that advice. And that capital that they think they are protecting will actually go up in smoke very soon. The fires that were seen in Joburg and Pretoria are coming to Senten. And the way we think is going to either determine whether the fires do end up in Sentin or they are prevented from coming to Sentin. And with the kind of consultants we have, I'm very uncomfortable. I'm not, Thanks, I'm not going to judge whether you should get rid of them or not, but they, they definitely need to be able to think out of the box. Can they evolve? Well, then, they, then they're not belonging to the dinosaurs. Um, but you have to ask yourself the question, why does foreign DFIs come into South Africa and see the opportunities that the, the, that the local pension funds don't see? Yeah, and I think just to wrap up, and a, and a, a quick example from my own experience and perspective, um, before joining Alexander Forbes, I was at FMO, the Dutch Development Finance Institution, so hence I know Johnny quite well. Um, the, uh, the case in point is one of a, uh, is a, a high, you know, a high pedigree, high quality, empowered manager locally that was raising money from the local industry for 36 months and couldn't scrounge up enough money to raise a, a viable first close to the extent that myself as FM, representing FMO had to come in and close the fund with a euro expensive dollar commitment that obviously was well received by the underlying manager but demonstrated that we have a gap and there's a big gap and I think let's, let's all work together to try and close that. And, and put sustainability front and center in our investment thesis. So on that note, I th I'd say thank you to the panelists for a great session and thanks for all the participation. It was uh, a great session. Thank you. Thank you.